Hello friends, I'm Robert Hamm with Virginia Second Amendment News. Today we're going to go over two topics. The first one being the ban of firearms in the Capitol and Pocahontas building. And also we're going to talk about uh, the new grandfather clause, so to speak. Show you where to find that, show you what's different in Bill 16 as compared to 961. Okay, so we're going to talk about those two things. At the end, if there's any time to go over anything else, we will definitely uh, answer some of your questions. As always, I'm out here doing this for you. If you enjoy what I'm doing, you're welcome to come over here and click the support button. Send me a cup of coffee via PayPal. That's great. But the biggest way that you can help me is to just like and share this video. There is a website under development where I just haven't had an opportunity to get that published yet. And let's see, let's just jump right into it. Okay, so we all know that the House Rules Committee was tasked with making the rules for what's going to take place as far as firearms within the Capitol building and the Pocahontas building. That's a power given to the House. If you want to know exactly how it happened and if you want to hear and see it, where do you go? So this is how you get there. You go to virginiageneralassembly.gov. Click on Virginia Legislature. You click on House. You come down here and you click on House Committees. Now this is it to the Rules Committee. It was given to the Rules Committee uh, in Rule 85 of uh, Senate Bill or House Bill, um, House Resolution Number 17. Okay, that was the big deal that we we heard about on uh, Wednesday. And so Rule 85 says that uh, the House Speaker, which would normally put this kind of a thing to the vote to the entire House, actually sent the uh, the decision making authority to the House Rules Committee. And when this resolution was passed, it was passed partisanly, uh, 55 Democrats to 45 Republicans, it automatically made that the way that this is going to work. So that adopted the new House rules for the current session. But it left a question of what's actually going on with the firearms, okay? So that's what we're looking at. Once we get here, we go to the Rules Committee. This is back on the Virginia General Assembly page. And we come over here and we can see the makeup of the House Rules Committee. And you can see we've got like 20, I'm just a quick count, looks like 20 Democrats and five Republicans. It might be more, I didn't actually count this, but we can definitely see five Republicans. Okay, that's great. It's important to note that uh, Republican uh, Todd Gilbert, okay, he's actually the minority leader for the House. So he speaks for the minority party, the Republican. And we're also going to know that Mullen is the vice chair. They're going to call in the Capitol Police Colonel Pike to talk, and you're going to find that uh, uh, Republican Delegate uh, Cox, as well as well as Knight and Austin uh, and Gilbert, all have some things to have some tough questions for him because it appears like we've got some double speak going on, and we'll get into that. So, how do you see this? Well, right here, if you want to find out, there's a subcommittee and whatever here. There's a joint rules subcommittee. That's going to be important. If you want to see what's on their agenda, you can see that. If they had any reports to file that you would find them here. Now, once the report is filed and available from this, you'll be able to go here and download it. I don't know how long that'll take. And you can see what's coming up on their agenda. We've got nothing coming up because it's already happened. It's archived. We go to the video. This is what I'm trying to share with you. I want you to see how to get to where we are. Now, in the video, uh, you're actually going to see the agenda. You can see the information. It's a 20 minute video. We're not going to watch it all. We're going to jump through. Uh, we're going to see the agenda, who is speaking, and then the people at the different times that they spoke. OK, but we'll just go straight from the agenda. I'm going to skip filler corn and just bring up Delegate Simon because I want you to hear what he says about the rules. Uh, yesterday, as part of our rules, uh, delegates to the Rules Committee, the authority to adopt a policy to apply to those areas under the control of the House of Delegates. Um, I, I think that the speaker's recommendation, what we'll do for the uh, initial period is uh, to simply adopt the an identical policy to the policy just adopted by the joint Rules Committee, which covers all areas of the Capitol. Certainly under Rule 85, uh, should we desire to, at a future rules meeting, we could adopt a firearms policy that was even more restrictive or a weapons policy that was even more restrictive. Uh, okay, so that's enough of that. What he's saying is, uh, as the meeting was called to order, Philip Corn asked him just to give a summary of what's going on. And Philip Corn is also the, uh, the chairman of the meeting, uh, of this committee. And so she asked him to explain what's happening on so that everybody could know. So he's telling us here what happened and the Joint Rules Committee uh, under there, they've decided just to adopt what the Joint Rules Committee has already adopted. Okay, so Joint Rules Committee. Well, that's where we go back to this page and find out what did the Joint Rules Committee adopt? And over here, we'll see, these are the people that are on the Joint Rules Committee. Filler Corn's on there as well. Mullen's on there. Simon's on there. So all the gang is on there. 
okay? And we can see what's on their agenda, and then we can see what's on the reports. They've got nothing, so this meeting doesn't have anything for us. So, wow, what do we do? This resolution has to be filed somewhere, so we go back to the legislative information system. We go out to bills and resolutions, okay? Uh, then we can go by passed by the Senate, right? And then we can come up here and start looking. And then we're going to see Joint Assembly, HR, uh, HJ 126. So what this actually is going to tell us is that they're just going to approve in Rule 5 the 2018-2019 rules general of the capital area, right? And so if we click on this, we go to here, we can actually see the rules of the House of Delegates from 2018 to 2019. This is important because what you're going to see when you scroll all the way down and we're just we're jumping through this. Uh, when we get to Rule 84, Capitol and Pocahontas building from last year, it made no mention of firearms. There was no Rule 85, which meant that the regular, the natural law of the land is what everybody went with. That's why you could carry in there. But when we get over here to Joint Resolution or House Resolution 17 and we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you can see that they've added an additional rule, Rule 85. So this is the part that we're not seeing that the Joint Committee accepted was this Part 85. That's what would be on this page right here, but it's not there yet, okay, because they, they just haven't put it up there. Now, this is a big circular kind of thing. Notice how it's just it's just kind of bouncing back and forth, but that's going to be important later, okay? So when we listen, we're going to find out that um, uh, they call up Colonel Pike and ask him some questions about this, and here we go. Let's hear this uh, Capitol Police Colonel speak. Very honorable organization, rich with history, and what I've tried to instill with my folks and myself is that we remain a nonpartisan uh, public safety agency here at the seat of government. And I've always tried to respect the, the leadership that's in place, uh, tried to Standard work enough. with uh, the tools and resources that we are given to ensure that uh, those guidelines, the rules that are in place, uh, that they are carried forward. Uh, throughout this complex and these buildings. And, and again, in this scenario, uh, when I was uh, uh, told that there would be a prohibition on firearms. And so here's the colonel, the head buana, so to speak, of the Capitol Police. And he is saying openly in, a, in a, an open meeting that he was told that there was going to be a prohibition. This is very important because the Democrats have been saying that they got the information from as a recommendation from the Capitol Police, that they're just going by the recommendation of the Capitol Police. Here's the guy in charge of the Capitol Police saying, nope, <laughs> I was told. And that's what Delegate Knight and Delegate Cox and Delegate Gilbert are going to be discussing because it's a very important part to see where the actual blame came from. And let's go ahead and skip to that. Well, from there, we go to Delegate Cox. Now, I sat through joint rules. I thought you said the same thing. And then, of course, you then, I think, said I did my best to put it in place. I think it was clearly implied that this was your idea, and this was your recommendation. So was this your idea and your recommendation, or was this something that you were told and then asked to implement? I was, I was told that there was going to be a prohibition on firearms and to put together my recommendations on how to handle that. Okay, so as you can see, he was told what was going to happen. He wasn't asked for a recommendation, which means quite importantly that the information that we're getting about how this came about is just shady, man. It's just it's just greasy. Okay, um, the Democrats. This is this is the part of the the thing that's that's kind of shady and nasty. If you want to continue looking through this, this is where you can find it. It's all right here. I'm going to leave it to that for now. But I would like to say that Delegate Gilbert and um, uh, Delegate Cox, Delegate Knight have a lot of uh, tough things to say. And they really, these are the Republicans that are really holding the Democrats' feet to the fire. This is worth a good watch if you're interested in a little laugh. Okay, let's uh, continue moving on along. We already talked about the Pocahontas building where the rule change happened. And this is kind of why, because it's shady. Remember we said it's kind of kind of a cyclical circle. There's nothing written down anywhere, but guns are banned now and we don't have any formal policy about them being banned they will go on to say they will go on to discuss that guns are banned within the buildings themselves not on the grounds but they also can change that policy anytime delegate simon from the beginning said exactly that they can change it whenever they want 
which means they're going to change it at some point in time. And he even said a more restrictive stance for firearms and weapons. It's very interesting that when the state, when Colonel Pike was asked later on in this meeting, if he would arrest someone that was a member of the General Assembly that was carrying within the buildings, his answer was no, he would not. So these guys won't arrest the elected officials, but they will arrest you or I. The reason that he gives for not arresting the elected officials is because during session, elected officials have a particular kind of immunity. Okay, we're going to move on over. So we've got House Bill 961. House Bill 961 is a mirror to House Bill 6 or Senate Bill 16 up until one point. Senate Bill 16 deals with the magazines, magazine bans down here at the end. And we'll talk about Senate Bill 16, but we already know quite a bit about it. Everything up to this point on both bills is exactly the same, word for word. Senate Bill 16 deals with uh, the difference in magazine bans and things like that, high capacity or standard capacity magazine bans, while 961, the House bill, deals with the grandfather cause, clause. Not really grandfather, but the registration. They kind of took out the grandfather, okay? There actually is a grandfather clause in the Code of Virginia, and I don't have it pulled up, so I'm not gonna pick it up right now, but the grandfather clause actually gives additional protections to people that have things that they don't want you to have. Here it doesn't, right? So they got rid of the grandfather clause in order to have this. Now, I am by no way, shape or form saying that I agree with this registration. I want you to understand that. Don't yonk this, okay? But there are some real things to consider. If you keep your firearm and you don't register it in accordance with the policy, come 2021, you're going to have some serious problems if you're caught. Now, if you're not caught, that's great. But we do know that the governor is already putting together in the budget a thug squad, goon squad, to go out and investigate these types of things. Now, we don't know exactly how it's going to do, but it's in the budget bill. $2 million for something like 24 units. He's already got an extra $110 million in the Department of Corrections. I did a video where I was sharing with you his lock you up budget. If you haven't watched that video, maybe I'll put a link for it. That's a great video. Because he's got $110 million, I share with you how you can find out how many people he's planning to lock up in the facilities. And it's about 2,000 people if you use that pool of money. Lots of people are stuck on the um, $250,000 that he puts for the infraction and the enforcement of like the background checks and this, that, and the other. Now, that's the wrong place to be looking. That $250,000, that pool is, is just one small little part of the pool, right? And that doesn't even cover... That doesn't, that's, that's just setting up the program for how you would have a reporting system in my reading of the bill. The actual $110 million is where all of the execution takes place and where all of the, the people get hired to do the job, where the facilities are built to house the, the law-abiding citizens that are no longer law-abiding when this happens. Anyways, my point is, watch that video if you haven't. It's a good video. So I don't agree with this, is what I'm saying, but I am going to say you got some problems coming up if you don't register, okay? Now, there's a, there's a way that you can look at this, okay? If you register, right, just like you've already got a registration for your concealed weapons permit. Let's talk about it this way. We'll get into this in a second, but let me just put this out there, okay? And don't beat me up in the comments. I'm trying to give you ideas, and if you're just bubba doing it, right, shut up and listen for a second because you're going to face a, a felony of five years exile in prison if one of these goon squads comes to your house, some of you might big talk and say you're going to blast them. I don't believe you. All right. You might blast them if they're coming down the street in tanks because we all would. Right. We, we would all feel like an army was marching on us. That's not how this is going to happen. It'll be one by two little things. Very, very quiet in the night. Right. You and then guess what? It, it'll be over before it started. OK, so. When you've got to look upstairs, and I think I've got a family living here and five years exile in prison to either get rid of my gun or register it or hide it and hope no one finds it. For me, um, that's not the fight. Registering the firearm isn't the boogaloo. And here's why. I've already registered. I've got a concealed weapons permit. Anytime I drive or the cop checks, he runs the plates. He knows I've got a CWP. He knows I'm a firearm owner, right? Now, they may be able to get, know the Virginia police, state police already know when you buy a firearm. They don't know exactly what you buy, but they know the type, rifle, pistol, things like that. I understand that. So there's already a quasi registry in a way. I don't agree with any of that. But what I'm saying is if you've got a family, if you don't have anything to live for 
then and your firearm is it, then man, then life has passed you by. But if you're like me and you've got a family and you look at and see your wife and you're like, bye bye for five years. I'm glad that this is here because it's a way to keep your firearm, use your firearm, carry your firearm, just like a concealed weapons permit. We really should have no permits for anything. Free men don't ask permission, right? But the reality is the legal system we work in, we do. So in order to carry concealed, I had to get a permit, okay? They've actually made a way for you to own an assault firearm here, and this is good. This shows the pressure that we've been putting on them has caused them to change their mind a little bit, which means we may be able to change their minds more, right? But this is better than a grandfather clause because with a grandfather clause, you probably wouldn't be able to go to and from your range and different things. Here, at least you can register it. You can still buy them. You can still sell them uh, in, in the Commonwealth if you have that permit. So there's still a way to get them. It's just much, much more restricted. Now, here's the good news. You guys don't believe me when I tell you this, or some people I talk to don't believe me. It's about a 50-50. This isn't the end. We're going to be alive two years from now. Okay, no, Nobody's going to run those tanks down the street, which means in two years... We have the chance to vote these guys out, okay? We can change this with our voice, but that means we recognize that this fight continues for two years and it doesn't let up, okay? That being said, let's actually look at it. Any person who legally owns an assault uh, firearm as defined above uh, or trigger activator or silencer or any of those things on July 1st, 2020 may retain possession of the firearm large capacity magazine or silence or trigger activator until January 1, 2021. So we've got basically an entire year from now until then. We figured this is going to pass. They expect it to pass. So we've got a year. So the concept of a felon overnight, a felon over year. You see what I mean? So we got a year to do something with it. And they've got four options. None of them is just going back to business as usual last year. All of them suck, but some of them suck less than getting shot or going to jail. So during that time, you can actually make your fire. You can break your gear so that it doesn't work. You can also remove it from the Commonwealth completely. Take it to North Carolina, your family down there. Sell it or transfer it to someone that will buy it legally right now. That's no problem. Or you can return it, right? Or, or surrender it, right? Anybody in possession after January 1, 2021, is going to have a problem you're going to be a felon unless you do the last thing which is get a permit to have it the nice part is the permit won't be able to exceed more than your concealed weapons permit so it's no more than 50 bucks it doesn't say if that's per rifle or just in total but it does give you the opportunity to give a permit now we come down here to 18.2-308.13 permit to possess an assault firearm or a civil penalty so then we down move down to part a any person who legally owns an assault firearm on july 1st 2020 can apply for a permit to possess the firearm. The application shall be on a form prescribed by the state police and shall include a certification statement. Uh, upon receipt of a complete application permit, the superintendent of the state police will actually issue the permit and the Department of Police may charge up to 50 bucks. So just like your concealed weapons permit, you can send it out and they can approve it. That's, that's a good solution here. When people talk about common sense gun control, they're kind of talking about this because this makes sense given what we're doing. Rather than not having anything, we actually have this compromise in between. I don't like it. We can change it in two years. But if you get the permit, then you could still go to your shooting range. You can still shoot. You can still use it. Uh, you, it's just like getting a tax stamp on your silencer or suppressor or anything like that from the BATFE. If they check you, I know if they check you, they got papers. If they check you, then you can go ahead and um, show the permit and be cool. Everything's good. I don't like that. But it's better than jail, right? Right now, okay? Um, the permit shall contain the name, address, gender, height, weight, and all those other things. Part C is Department of Police shall on or before July 1, 2026, review the criminal record history of any person that was approved. So they're just saying that within five years of its approval, they're gonna check again. So you need to submit again with a criminal background check, very similar to your steel weapons permit. And we're gonna continue again. A person issued a permit uh, to possess a, an assault firearm may possess it only under the following conditions. Okay, so now we've got some restrictions. 
permit is issued to the person while in his home or on his property or of another person's property, provided the person has written permission on his person while on such property. That's a bunch of crap. Like if you're shooting on Bubba Jed's property, you got to have his written permission. It doesn't say whether it's got to be notarized or anything, but you got to have written permission. We don't like this. This is no fun. But you can have it while at a shooting range, shooting gallery or other designated area for the purpose of target shooting or at a public or private club organization whose members organize together for the purpose of practicing shooting targets or competing in target shooting matches uh, while engaged in lawful hunting. Check that out. So if you're hunting, you can have your firearm out there while you're hunting. <laughs> this is funny. And you can also have it while you're surrendering to the proper authority. This is a bunch of crap that, you, that this is here, but at least it's it's something. If you don't have your permit with you in any of those places that you were issued that we talked about before, part one through part four, then there will be a $25 civil penalty that you have to pay. And you must submit the permit with a photo ID upon demand of a law enforcement officer. So demand is important. It's not like they come up to you and they just say hi and you have to show it to them. They have to ask for it. So part E is talking about transferring to an executor of your estate, like something that happens and, and someone passes away. Part F, the Department of State Police will enter the name and the description of the person issue, issued the assault uh, weapons permit and the, into the uh, Virginia Criminal Information Network. So now uh, they're going to put you in there in the database. This is where the registration really comes down to play. They're going to put you in the database, and uh, that's something that you got to recognize. Uh, that's not any fun, but there it is. And then finally, G, the superintendent shall uh, promulgate regulations pursuant to the administrative process. That just gives them the right to make the procedure as bureaucratic as possible. Interestingly enough, back in the day when the concealed weapon permits were taking six months, a year, two years to, to come about, the Supreme Court of Virginia smacked the localities and the lower courts saying that, no, you have to issue it within 45 days to suffer. I believe it was a $10,000 per day fine. That got them in line real quick. I imagine that although it doesn't say it here, uh, we'll find that they come back pretty quickly um, right off the bat. Okay, so let's switch over back to Senate Bill 16. Uh, a lot of questions come up as far as what is allowed and what's not allowed, what's going to be banned, and what's the gray area. So let's look at the new term of assault firearm. For the purposes of this section, an assault firearm means a semi-automatic center fire rifle that expels single or multiple projectiles by action of explosion or combustion with a fixed magazine capacity in excess of 10 rounds. Okay, so any rifle that has a fixed magazine, like your, like your repeaters and stuff like that, or your lever action rifles, in excess of 10 rounds is an assault firearm. Now, this is a problem. You guys already know it, but let's talk about that. 1022, Marlin Model 60, those are some that I can think of right there that hold more than 10 rounds, right, that uh, that are going to be banned. They are banned. And those have to do with fixed magazines. You guys can list down in the comments below if you'd like to add some more. Okay, so now we're going to change up the definition because that was a fixed magazine. The next part is going to deal with something with a removable magazine, and that's what it does. A semi-automatic semi centerfire rifle that expels like before and has the following characteristics. Just one has one of the following characteristics with the ability to attach a detachable magazine. So the magazine can come out and you have one of the following characteristics. A folding or telescoping stock, a pistol grip, a thumb hole stock. Uh, think about you uh, SKS guys. <laughs> a second hand grip or protruding grip that can be held by the non-trigger hand. So your Ford Assist, your Ford Grip, or your broomstick. A bayonet mount, a grenade launcher, a flare launcher, a silencer, a flash suppressor, a muzzle brake, a muzzle compensator, a threaded, bearable, a threaded barrel capable of accepting a silencer, a flash suppressor, a muzzle brake, a muzzle compensator, or any characteristic of like kind is enumerated through these clauses. This last part, any characteristic of like kind is a problem because that could mean anything. It's so vague, it doesn't mean, it means everything really. So let's talk about these in general. I'm gonna go backwards. A muzzle compensator, you know, that's that's the AR platform guys. That's the AK platform guys. That's anything that's got a muzzle compensator or a muzzle brake, you know. Think about your um, uh, BARs, your 50, you got a muzzle brake on the end of that, right? Even though you might have a magazine with five rounds, the fact that you've got a detachable magazine, right? And the muzzle brake is a problem, okay? A flash suppressor, once again, 
a flash suppressor. Your standard AR-15 or M4 is going to have a flash suppressor, okay? A silencer, okay? Now, with silencer, you're talking a little bit different, right? So, because all of these generally deal with rifles right here. But in the next part, they're going to talk about pistols, okay? So, a threaded barrel capable of accepting a silencer, okay? So, I've heard people talk about shotguns. I don't think that any, there are any shotguns with the threaded barrel for the choke are capable of accepting a silencer, flash suppressor, muzzle brake, or muzzle compensator. Okay, so if they are, let me know, but I'm not aware of any. So I don't think this really applies to shotguns. It doesn't seem to apply to shotguns. It seems to be directly aimed at the AR style uh, platform guys. And anything else that's, mo any modular, modern, lightweight uh, fire system is, is what this is aimed at. So if you've got a detachable magazine and anything underneath it, like that flare launcher, no good. Or a grenade launcher, that 38 millimeter. A bayonet mount, that's crap. You can't put a knife on your on your rifle. That makes no sense. Now rifles have had knives sticking on the end of them since rifles began, okay? <laughs> so you can't have a bayonet mount, that's bullshit, okay? Um, or a second hand grip. These are cosmetic things right here. A thumb hole stock. Uh, come on, man. This this is a bunch of crap. A, a pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the rifle. So this is important. That's the pistol grip stock, like on your AR-style pistol or AR-style uh, platform rifle, or even on your AK. That's not the pistol grip that you might see on any kind of uh, lever action or, or cowboy, like the uh, Marlin cowboy action. It's got a pistol grip, but it doesn't protrude conspicuously. It doesn't look like a, like a pistol grip it's just sloped and has a nice little curve so if you have a firearm that has any of those characteristics as a, a rifle it is an assault firearm and it is included in house bills 961 registry okay got to think about that it's it is included okay so so far assault firearms when dealing with rifles both fixed and detachable magazines have two different criteria so let's move on to pistols what does it say about pistols any semi-automatic centerfire pistol that expels single or multiple projectiles by action of an explosive combustible material with a fixed magazine capacity in excess of 10 rounds. Okay, so I just can't think of pistols that have fixed magazine capacities, not wheel guns or, or revolvers, I should say, in excess of 10 rounds, but there you go. But really, when you think about a semi-automatic pistol, now we're talking about your, your handguns that people carry for concealed carry and stuff like that. So this is where it gets interesting again and it seems like this is really aimed more towards the ar pistol platform group of firearms because it's going to say the same thing any centerfire pistol that has that expels projectiles with a detachable magazine and any of the following characteristics a folding or telescoping stock a thumb hole stock a second hand grip uh, that can be held by the non-trigger hand the capacity to accept magazines that attach outside the pistol grip a shroud that is attached to it or, or completely encircles the barrel that permits the shooter to hold the pistol with a non-trigger hand without being burned. A manufactured weight of 50 ounces or more when the pistol is unloaded. A threaded barrel capable of accepting a silencer flash suppressor, a barrel extender or a forward hand grip or any characteristics of the like. Once again, we got that any characteristics of the like. As you see here, I see that it's, it's really easy that they're targeting firearms that are built on the AR platform. But this also means that if you've got your Gucci Glock with a small micro compensator on the front, no go. But this also means that your Glock, considering you have the proper magazine from SB16, is not an assault firearm because it, a, a standard Glock or your Kimber doesn't have a folding or telescoping stock. It doesn't have a thumbhole stock. It doesn't have a hand grip. It doesn't have an ability to attach a magazine outside of the pistol grip. It doesn't have a shroud that's attached or partially encircling that keeps you from burning your hand when you hold it. Most of them aren't manufactured with more than 50 ounces of weight. And, it, and here's what it does have. If you have a threaded barrel capable of accepting a silencer, flash suppressor, barrel extender, or forward hand grip, which that wouldn't happen, but for the, the Glock, then yeah, that will be an assault firearm and you'll need to register it. So if you want to use your compensator and roll, run around with it, and if you want to uh, put a, uh, a threaded barrel on it for a so silencer, you have to register your Glock, okay? Or any other firearm. We're just, I'm just using that term generically right now. Which also means you're not carrying it for everyday use. You will not. It's not going to be allowed. 
Now, the nice part is they don't say anything about red dots. Okay, so you can have your Glock, you can have your suppressor height sights, you can have your uh, red dot, you can have whatever cool stuff you want on it. As long as you've got nothing else going on there, you're going to be good to go. Okay, to summarize what we have here, if you've got a rifle with a fixed magazine capacity of more than 10 rounds, that's an assault firearm. You'll have to register it. That means your Marlins and your Rugers, those little 22 guys, they're out of there because they can hold more than 10 rounds. If you have a rifle and the rifle has a detachable magazine, and any of the characteristics that you would associate with a modern AR platform rifle, it will be banned. Require registration or get it out or five years exile in prison. Who said it? Peter on uh, the family guy? Federal pounds you in the ass prison. Five years. Okay. <laughs> right. Maybe not federal, but state prison. Definitely. Moving on to pistols. If you have a pistol that has a fixed magazine capacity, of 10 rounds or less, that's fine. But more than 10 rounds is a no-go, fixed magazine. But then if you have a pistol that's more modular, like we think about a semi-auto, right? Not a revolver or anything like that. Then yeah, if that semi-auto pistol has a collapsible or folding stock, such as your AR pistol platform, or has a threaded barrel, such as just a nice threaded barrel for a silencer, or a micro comp, that's no good. So your Gucci guns and things like that are gonna have to be registered. Carrying your 45, your 1911, your Kimber, whatever like that, no problem. If you got a Ruger 1911, if you if you're rocking any one of those steel guns, unloaded weight less than 50 ounces, no problem. Okay, uh, I don't know what the new Sig, what that uh, that that magnesium permeated alloy. I don't know if I think that's only 32 ounces or something like that. You guys will know down in the comments. That's still legal too. So this is a bunch of crap, but this is what it says. So I'm not saying that it's it's good. It's obviously bad, but this is what it says. And I got some questions about that. So I wanted to put that out there in the video. Whew, that's a lot of information, wasn't it? Okay, and that'll do it for tonight. Guys, I'm Robert Hamm with VHUA News. I'm reporting on your rights. I want to thank you for watching.